Hello everyone, so this is the GCSE Combined Science Trilogy paper. This is Chemistry Paper 1, a higher tier paper that pupils sat in May 2018. I'm going to go through a model, how I would have tackled it, and then on the right hand side is a link to the blank past paper and mark scheme, along with specific revision videos for the content question by question. So, first of all, looking at question number one then. This question is about electrolysis. A student investigates the mass of copper produced during electrolysis of a copper chloride solution. It shows the apparatus. So you've got the power supply, you've got the solution. You can see around the negative electrode, you're getting your copper made. And then you've got a gas being produced on the positive electrode. What gas is produced at the positive electrode? Well, we've been told it's a solution of copper chloride. And the rule is, if you have a halogen, which is a group seven element in electrolysis, that gas will be made. So the gas is simply chlorine. Question 1.2. Copper is produced at a negative electrode. What does that tell you about the reactivity of copper? Now, to remember and know this question, you need to remember the reactivity series of metals. So the medium reactive metals like iron, zinc, lead, they are all above hydrogen. And then below hydrogen on the reactivity series of metals are the least reactive ones like copper, uh, gold and silver and platinum, okay? So what this is effectively telling you is that when you do um, electrolysis, if you've got a least, a metal that is lower than hydrogen, you will make the metal. But if you've got a metal in a solution that is more reactive than hydrogen, then you actually don't make the metal and you make hydrogen gas. Now, because in this practical, we have got copper and we can see in the diagram we're making copper. It's telling us that copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So it is the first one. OK, so you've got to remember the rule is when you're predicting what elements you're going to make in electrolysis. If you're looking at whether the metal is made, you're comparing it against hydrogen uh, reactivities in the reactivity series. So table one shows the students' results then. You've got the time in minutes going one, two, four, and five. You've got their results and you've got their means. Determine the mean mass of copper produced after three minutes. So you can see we're missing a set of results here for three minutes. And we've got to predict what the mass of copper will be after three minutes. Now it's only a one mark question and it's towards the beginning of the paper. So using a bit of logic, it shouldn't be that hard. So you look at what pattern you can see in your mean. It's going from 0.6 to 1.2. It then, we know we're missing a number here and then it goes to 2.4. So we can tell immediately it's going up in 0.6s. So adding 0.6 to 1.2 gives me a mean of 1.8. So using a bit of logic, that is what the number should be. Question 1.4 then. Calculate the mass of copper produced in experiment two after five minutes. Use the table on page three. So it's effectively saying, what is this number here? Now this is just calculating a mean, but it's asking us to do it in reverse because they've given us the mean value and we've got to figure out what X is. So I'm just gonna go back to the pre previous page and I know it's 3.02 plus X plus 3.01 equals 3.06. But remember with a mean, you divide it by three. So that is our equation. And effectively what we need to do is rearrange this equation to give us our answer. So what I would do in this situation when I've substituted in these numbers to get rid of the divide three is times both sides of the equation by three. OK, so that gives me uh, 9.18 equals 3.02 plus 
plus x plus 3.01. Now to get uh, x by itself, I'm just going to then minus both of these numbers, 3.01 and then minus 3.02, and that should then tell us the value of x. So minus 3.02 gives me 6.16, minus 3.01 gives me a value of 3.15. Now you could then uh, go back and do the mean the normal way and just double check your values or if you don't like the rearranging method you can just effectively do it through trial and error okay until you get a number that then gives you that mean question 1.5 then the copper chloride solution used in the investigation contained 300 grams per decimeter of solid copper chloride dissolved in one decimeter cubed of water the student used a 50 centimetre cubed of copper chloride in each experiment. Calculate the mass of solid copper chloride used in each experiment. So in order to do this, we need, we've, we've been told about concentration, mass and volume. So we need to remember the equation. Concentration is mass over volume. OK, if I want to put it into a triangle like that. This question is asking me to calculate mass. So I know mass is concentration times by volume. If I substitute my values in then, my concentration is 300 in grams per decimeter cubed, and my volume is 50 centimeter cubed, okay? Now I know there's gonna be a slight trick in this question because it is a free marker. Obviously, they've given it in different units. I would need to convert centimeter cubed into decimeter cubed. Now, you should remember that one decimeter cubed is equal to 1000 centimeter cubed. So what I would do to get centimeter cubed into decimeter cubed is divide that by a thousand, which then gives us 300 times by 0 0.05. And when you times those together, that gives you 15 grams, okay? So it's making sure you convert, because you're going to the bigger unit of decimeter cubed, you would then divide by a thousand. And that is question one. Okay, so question number two then. This question is about sodium and chlorine. Figure two shows the positions of sodium and chlorine in the periodic table. State one difference and one similarity in the electronic structure of sodium and chlorine. Okay, so if you think about a difference first, well, obviously sodium is in group one and chlorine's in group seven. What the group number tells you is the number of electrons in that atom's outer shell. Now, if you didn't know that, you could draw out the electron structures using the periodic table to help you figure out the differences. But simply, if you know that rule, you can just put the number of outer shell electrons is different in each atom. Now, the similarity between them, if we look at them in terms of our, they may be in different groups, but they are in the same period. And you should remember that the periods say how many shells they have. So both of these atoms are in the third period down. So therefore they both have three shells of electrons. Okay. So they both have three shells of electrons. Okay, question 2.2. Sodium reacts with chlorine to produce sodium chloride, NaCl. Describe what happens when a sodium atom reacts with a chlorine atom. Write about electron transfer in your answer. So, we know that sodium, group 1, and chlorine in group 7, they like to bond because, remember, all atoms want a full outer shell. Sodium has, would have the electron structure... 2, 8, 1, whereas chlorine would have the electron structure 2, 8, 7. So what is effectively is going to happen is sodium is going to give that one outer electron to chlorine. So we just need to summarise that. 
So sodium will lose one electron from its outer shell. Now that would actually be two marks in the mark scheme. Then you would say chlorine will gain the electron. So both now have a full outer shell. Now that would get you the final two marks on this. Now personally, I would also always go into a bit more detail and say that sodium, because it's lost an electron, will become a positively charged atom, Na+, and chlorine, because it has gained an electron, will be Cl-. Question 2.3 then. The reaction between sodium and chlorine is an exothermic reaction. Complete the reaction profile for sodium and chlorine. Okay, so this is about energy changes. We know it's an exothermic reaction, so it is giving out heat energy to the surroundings. Now, what that means is because energy is being given out, the reactants have more energy than the products because it's being released. Okay, now in order for any reaction to take place, normally you have to have a, add a bit of energy to it, and that is called the activation energy, which is why you get this little bump here. Now, it hasn't, that is enough to get you the two marks in this question, but personally, I would always just label and add on. The difference between the reactants and the top of the um, jump is called the activation energy. That is the minimum amount of energy needed to start the reaction. And then the line at the bottom is your products, okay? Also, the difference between the reactants and the products is the energy change or the energy being released from the reaction. Question number three then. A student plans to prepare pure crystals of copper sulfate. One student's method is add a spatula of calcium carbonate to the dilute hydrochloric acid in a beaker. Okay. When the fizzing stops, Heat the solution with a Bunsen burner until all the liquid is gone. This method contains several errors and does not produce copper sulfate crystals. Explain the improvements the students should make to the method so that the pure crystals of copper sulfate are produced. Okay, so this is effectively a six mark saying this method is really, really bad. How can we make it better and correct? So if we start off with then the errors in this practical, what have they done wrong? Well, they're trying to make copper sulfate, but they're actually using calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. So what they would be making then is the salt calcium chloride. Okay, so remember, hydrochloric acid makes chlorides, sulfuric makes sulfates, nitric makes nitrate salts. So, they are using the wrong chemicals. They need to use something that has copper in it, so they should use copper oxide. And they shouldn't use sulfuric acid they should use, sorry, they shouldn't use hydrochloric acid, they should use sulfuric acid to make copper sulfate. Now I would personally write out the equation, so copper oxide plus sulfuric acid makes copper sulfate plus water. So that is the first two marks then, what they haven't done. Now, there are also several stages to this that they haven't done. The first thing is that they've just added um, one spatula of the powder. They shouldn't just add one powder of it. You want to add enough of your base to make sure that all of that acid has been neutralized. So what you need to do is, um, add, we say we add 
an excess of, co uh, of um, copper oxide to ensure all the acid is neutralized. Okay, so that's the key phrase to use, add an excess. And then another improvement to the method that they need to use is they need to then remove that excess and they can remove that solid powder, that unreacted powder that we've added loads of by filtration. So you would then to remove the excess, use filtration to remove the excess powder. Okay, and then finally, another improvement to the method, they've said when the fizzing stops, heat the solution with a Bunsen burner until all the liquid is gone. So if you heat, and when I'm sure when you've done this practical, if you heated the solution too much and you got rid of all of the water, you would have seen the crystals start to spit um, and they break down really easily. So you don't heat it until all the water is gone. You heat it until most of the water has gone and then you allow the last bit of water to evaporate naturally. So do not heat all the way. Leave some water to evaporate naturally. And that will give you much bigger crystals of copper sulfate. Okay, so key parts, if I'm going to summarize the improvements to this, you use sulfuric acid, not hydrochloric. You use copper carbonate or copper oxide, not calcium carbonate. You add an excess of the powder when you react it with the acid. You then filter to remove that excess and then you heat gently or partially evaporate it. You don't uh, heat it until all the liquid is gone. Okay, so question number four then. This question is about the halogens. Write the state symbol for chlorine at room temperature. Well, chlorine, we should know as a gas, so therefore it's just simply a G. The four state symbols you need to know is solid, liquid, gas, and the other one is aqueous, which just means dissolved in a solution. A liquid is used when it is a pure solution, like pure water, distilled water. Question 4.2. Figure 4 represents one molecule of fluorine. Complete the dot and cross diagram on figure 4. You should, only sh you should show only the electrons in the outer shells. So we know that fluorine exists as a molecule F2, and we've got to show how its electrons are bonded together using dots and crosses. So the left one, if we know that fluorine is in group seven, we'll have seven electrons, as will the one on the right. They both want to get a full outer shell, so they're each going to share one electron in this bond, okay? Now, I just need to make sure that each uh, fluorine has got the correct amount of electrons around its shell. I know that each one has got to have seven, so three, four, five, six, seven, and then using the dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So just double checking now. My crosses, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so the left side is happy, and now I can check the right one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So my right hand fluorine is then happy. So that is it completed. A fluorine atom can be re represented as 919F. What is the total number of electrons in a fluorine molecule? Well, the bottom number, remember, is your number of protons, but it also tells you in an atom the number of electrons. So if I've got nine electrons in a single F atom, in F2, I would have double it, which is 18. Aluminium reacts with bromine to produce aluminium bromide. 
complete the balanced equation for this reaction. Now, this is really quite a hard question at this stage of the paper. What you have to know is that aluminium is Al3+, that because it's in group 3, it makes a group 3 ion, uh, a 3 plus ion. Bromine's in group 7, and therefore you are going to need 3 bromines to cancel out that charge of the aluminium. So the product that is going to be made is AlBr3 because an atom, so a molecule of aluminium bromide or any molecule should have a overall neutral charge. So your positive charges have to equal your negative charges. So you need three times the amount of bromine to cancel out the charge of the aluminium. So AlBr3. Now what we can do is start balancing it, okay? On the right hand side, we've got two aluminiums. So we're gonna need a big two on our left hand side. And then on the right hand side, we've got six bromines because we've got two lots of Br3. So to give us six bromines on the left hand side, we'd have to put a big three there to give us three lots of Br2 to give you six and that gives us our balanced symbol equation. Question 4.5 then. When chlorine reacts with potassium bromide, the chlorine displaces the bromine. So if chlorine has come along here with potassium bromide, it's kicked out the bromine to leave bromine all alone and it's bonded with the potassium itself. So we can say that chlorine is more reactive than bromine, but we need to explain why. And we need to link this back to their electron structures. I've drawn at the bottom down here the electron structures of chlorine and bromine. You can do this yourself in your paper to help you explain it. Chlorine has the electron structure 287, bromine is 2887. So why is chlorine more reactive than bromine? If I've got my potassium atom with its one lone electron that both of these atoms want, why is it going to go to the chlorine? Well, it's simply down to the size of the atom and therefore the attraction it has. So I could say chlorine is more reactive because it is smaller. Or you could also add in, it has fewer energy levels or shells, okay? So therefore, because of that, because it is smaller, the positive charge of the nucleus of a chlorine atom is going to be bigger than the positive attraction of the bromine because it's going to be nearer. So the positive pull of the chlorine nucleus is bigger than the bromine nucleus, okay? Therefore, chlorine can gain the electron from potassium or any other atom more easily. Therefore, it makes it more reactive, okay? So it's just saying, because chlorine is smaller, there's a shorter distance, and therefore the attraction of the nucleus is bigger for the chlorine atom, the, the bromine can't, be, uh, can't easily pull this uh, potassium ion in because the distance, because it's got more shells, is much bigger. Okay, so this is a trend that you've got to know in group seven. As you go down group seven, they become less reactive because that distance and that attraction, um, because the distance increases and the attraction of the nucleus decreases. Okay then, so question five. This question is about structure and bonding. Figure five shows part of the structure and bonding in diamond. Explain why diamond has a high melting point. 
Well, you've got the structure of diamond here, and as you can see, it is a giant covalent substance, okay? You should know that diamond is made of carbon. We can see from the diagram, each carbon that is in the middle has four bonds coming off it, okay? Now, carbon is not a metal, and there are no metal atoms in it, so therefore the type of bonding in it is covalent bonding. All the carbon atoms are sharing electrons. So you could say it is a giant covalent structure with strong covalent bonds between each carbon. You could then say each carbon has four strong bonds. Therefore, a lot of energy is therefore needed to overcome these bonds and melt it, which is therefore giving it a high boiling point. So your marks would be saying it's a giant covalent structure with covalent bonds, stating clearly that diamond has four strong bonds, because that is the key difference with graphite, which only has three. And therefore, obviously, you're gonna need a lot of heat energy to break those bonds and overcome it. So question 5.2 then. Figure six shows part of the structure and bonding in sodium chloride. Explain the conditions needed for sodium chloride to conduct electricity. Well, sodium chloride, because you've got a metal and you've got a non-metal, these are an ionic compound. Now, when things are a metal, sorry, when things are solid, they cannot conduct. They can't conduct when they are a solid because the ions cannot move. Remember, because it's an ionic substance now, we're now talking about ions, which are positive and negative, okay? So in order for it to conduct electricity, these ions need to be able to move. They can't do it in a solid. So there are two different ways you can get these ions free. The quickest way is to simply melt the substance, okay, so the ions can move, okay, but ionic compounds, they have a really high melting and boiling points because you've got all these positive and negative charges attracting it to, towards each other. It has a high electrostatic attraction. So it's not very hard, it's not very easy to melt them. So the second way of doing it is actually to dissolve the ions into a solution. So again, the ions can move freely. Okay, so We've actually got the three marks here because we've said the conditions for it. You can either melt or you can dissolve it into a solution. And we've explained the reason why it's so that ions can move freely and carry and conduct the electricity. Question 5.3 then. Figure seven shows the structure of sodium. Describe how sodium conducts thermal energy. And you can see the structure of sodium here. You've got those positive charges. And I actually don't like this diagram. I think this is a bit of a trick. They've missed off the electrons in the structure. Okay, so you should know sodium is a metal and each atom gives up some of its electrons to become a free delocalized C of electrons 
and it's these, this 3 delocalized sea of electrons that can move through the structure and carry electricity. Okay, so your three marks would be then for these questions. Sodium has three delocalized electrons, which are free to move and they carry energy through the structure. And this applies to both thermal energy and also electrical charge. So the principle is the same. It has the three delocalized electrons which can move and therefore that's what makes metals good conductors of heat and electricity. Okay, so question number six then. Question two, uh, sorry, group two, metal carbonates firmly decompose to produce a metal oxide and a gas. Give the formula of each product when calcium carbonate is heated. So we've got calcium carbonate and it's going to be heated and it's going to decompose into two different products. Now, we know one of them is going to be a gas and just by looking at the formula, you can predict the product of one of the, what the gas is going to be, which is CO2. Okay, so one of our products is the gas carbon dioxide. What we've then got, if we take out the carbon and we take out two of the oxygens, what have we got left? We've got then calcium oxide left over. So it would be broken down into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Question 6.2. The relative formula mass of a group 2 metal carbonate is 197. The relative atomic masses are 12 is carbon and oxygen is 16. Calculate the relative atomic mass of the group 2 metal in the metal carbonate. So we always know a metal carbonate is the metal part, let's call that X, CO3. And we know the total mass is going to be 197. If I've, what I can do then to calculate the mass of X is calculate the mass of what I do know and then whatever is left over will be the atom X. So we've got one carbon, so one times 12 is 12, and we've got three lots of oxygen, three lots of 16, which gives me 48, add them together for a total of 60. So CO3 has the relative formula mass of 60. So 197 minus 60 gives me a relative formula mass of 137. So this is my relative formula mass. I would then look at my periodic table and the atom that has a mass of 137 would be barium, Ba. Figure 8 shows the volume of gas produced when a group 2 metal carbonate, W, is heated. Calculate the gradient of the line in figure 8. So, for a gradient, it's always the change in Y divided by the change in X. Okay, so always on the graph, I personally always look for the easiest points to read where the line crosses a really obvious point. So I know my change in my Y value is 250. And I then know my change in my X value going along is 1.5. So 250 divided by 1.5 equals 167. And then the unit, what I would do is just combine the units that they give me in the graph. So it would be grams per centimetre cubed. Question 6.4. 24 decimeter cubed of gas was produced when one mole of the group 2 carbonate is heated. Determine the relative formula mass of the group 2 carbonate. Use figure 8. Okay, so if I know I've got 24 decimeter cubed is going to equal 
a certain volume of gas, I've got the graph that can tell me how much uh, gas will be made from different amounts, so I've got to use that graph. So if I go back, now it doesn't give me a value of 24 decimeter cubed, it only gives me it in centimeter cubed. So what I can do is use a number that I could then work with. So instead of using uh, 24 decimeter cubed, I could use 240 centimeter cubed. And if I go along and then down, that gives me a value of 1.45 grams. So I know that 1.45 grams gives me a value of 240 centimeter cubed of gas. Now, I've now got to think how I can work these together, and this goes back to converting units. I know 24 decimeter cubed is the same as 204, uh, 24,000 centimeter cubed. So if I've got, instead of 240, if I've got 224,000 centimeter cubed of gas, this is 100 times more than the value I got from my graph. So what I would have to do is times my mass by 100 to make it balance out. So it would be 145 grams would give me 224,000 uh, centimetre cubed, which is the same as 24 decimetre cubed. So the relative formula mass would be 145. Okay, so question seven then. A scientist does two tests on four white solids, it's A, B, C and D. You add the sample to distilled water and you stir it, so we know they're testing solubility. And then you're testing the pH of the solution after you've attempted to dissolve it. It's given you the data here, so the appearance after stirring. So you can see A and B are making colour solutions and there's no solid left behind. So these two samples must be soluble. And therefore C and D have no have solid remains left over. So therefore you would say that these two are roughly insoluble. You've then been given the names of them here, magnesium, phosphorus, silicon or sodium. And then you've been given their solubility uh, per 100 centimetre cubed of water. The question is, identify the solids A, B, C and D and explain your answers. So what I'll do for the sake of time is annotate it on this slide. Obviously, you would just write your answer on the answer page. So A if we try and work out what A is, it has a high solubility because there's no solid remaining and it has a high pH. So if I look at my table, which ones have a high solubility? It will either be phosphorus or sodium. So therefore A must be sodium. Now you would have used in the lab uh, sodium hydroxide, which is an alkali, and therefore sodium oxide would be an alkali. So A is equal to sodium oxide because it has, this is your reasoning, a high solubility and uh, it makes a strong alkali. Therefore, the only other one which would have a high solubility because it's no solid must be, uh, B would have to be phosphorus oxide because magnesium and silicon don't dissolve. So B must be phosphorus oxide because it has a high solubility, but it's not an alkali substance. It makes a strong acid. You might have used phosphoric acid in the lab before. C and D, these are the ones that have no solubility. So it's either, or very little solubility. So it's either magnesium oxide or silicon dioxide. Now the answer to help you with this is to do with these two words here. 
colourless solution or colourless liquid. If there is, a, if it is a solution, it means that something, it might be a tiny amount, but something has dissolved. So a solution must be when you have a bit of dissolving. Now it can be a tiny bit. And if we look at the solubility of magnesium oxide, it's 0.01. So it's magne C must be magnesium oxide because it makes a solution also has a low solubility, but a little bit does dissolve. It also makes a weak alkali. Your reasoning for D, just explaining it, would be, uh, D would be silicon because it is totally insoluble, does not make a solution. So you get a lot of marks for figuring out which one is which, but of course, a lot of the marks come from the explanation. Okay, so as long as you clearly identify, and I would set it out like this, exactly which one you think is which and the reasons for it. Just put it into short bullet point sentences and then you're done. Question 7.2. 10 centimetre cubed of solution B is added to a beaker. Distilled water is added to the beaker until the final volume is um, 1,000 centimetre cubed. The pH of the solution is measured before and after the water, distilled water is added. It shows the results. So therefore, when you've got 10 centimetre cubed, it equals pH 3. When you've got 1,000 centimetre cubed of water, acid, uh, water added, it will equal a different pH. Now, in order to answer this question, you've got to be aware that the pH of a solution changes every 10 by um, when it is diluted by a factor of 100. OK, so if a free pH free is when you've got 10 centimetre cubed of water, pH four would be when you've got 100 centimetre cubed of water and therefore pH 5 is when you have 1,000 centimetre cubed of water. So that is just that you've got to know that pH is linked to a dilution factor of 100. So the pH in this situation, if you add 1,000 centimetre cubed of water, it would give you a pH of 5. Question eight then. This question is about iron, okay? Iron reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid to produce iron chloride solution and one other product. Name the product. So what I would do in this situation is try and write out the symbol equation for it to help us. So we've got iron, which is Fe, and hydrochloric acid, you should know is HCl. That is going to make iron chloride, which is FeCl, and then I can look what uh, atoms I've got left over while I've got H left over. So the product is going to be hydrogen. Obviously, I haven't balanced that equation, but I'm just using process of elimination to work out what the gas must be. It is the key rule. Metal plus acid makes a salt and hydrogen gas. Suggest how any unreacted iron could be separated from the mixture. Well, iron is a metal, it is so, um, insoluble, so you could filter it, or you could, because iron is one of the magnetic materials, use a magnet. So either of those would get you the mark. Then, magnesium reacts with iron chloride solution. You've got the balance symbol equation there. 0.12 grams of magnesium reacts with excess iron chloride solution. You've got the relative uh, masses there. Magnesium is 24, iron is 56. Calculate the mass of iron produced, okay? So if we take it one step at a time then, so this is a reacting masses question, 
one of the hardest calculations that you've got in these papers, but just take it one step at a time. The equation you need to know is the number of moles equals the mass divided by the relative formula mass. Now, if we look at what two parts of the equation is actually asking us about, because in a reacting masses question, it will give you information about one piece and then it will ask you to find the other piece. The other two or various compounds in the equation are not needed. So we've been told 0.12 grams of magnesium, so I know I'm gonna need magnesium, reacts with excess iron chloride solution. Because it's in excess, I'm not finding that out. Okay, so I can just cross through that. Calculate the mass of iron produced. So I'm also looking at my iron, I'm not worried about the magnesium chloride. So those are the two parts that I've got. I need to calculate the mass of iron, but I've only been given information about magnesium. Okay, so the first thing that I need to do is calculate my moles of magnesium. So magnesium moles is going to equal 0.12 divided by the relative formula mass, which is 24, which gives me 0 0.005 moles of magnesium. So I've got that to that stage already, and that would give me one or two marks. What I now need to do is use the equation and the number of moles given to me to work out how many moles of iron I must have. Now I can see here I've got a 3 to 2 ratio. So what I would personally do to work out the number of moles of this is divide 0 0.05 by 3 and then times it by 2 to give me my moles of iron. So 0 0.005 divided by 3 because there's three parts of magnesium but I want two parts of it for iron that gives me 0 0.003 uh, recurring, okay? So that is my moles of iron. When I've got that, what I can then do is use the equation, rearrange the equation, mass equals moles times relative formula mass. Now I know my moles of iron which is 0 0.0033 times by the relative formula mass, which is 56, uh, gives me an answer of 0 0.1866 grams of iron. But this question isn't asking it in grams, I want it in milligrams. So the final mark would be to divide uh, sorry, not divide, times this number by a thousand to put it into milligrams because I'm going to a smaller unit, which would give me uh, 187, using a um, rounding, 187 milligrams. And that would give me five marks. So the key stages in a reacting masses question is identify the two things you need, find the moles, off the one part that you've been given information about, work out the number of moles off the missing part, and then rearrange the equation, uh, mass equals uh, moles times relative formula mass to give you the mass of the missing uh, reactant. Okay, thank you. That should be question 8.3. Last question then, question 8.4. Explain which species is reduced in the reaction between magnesium and iron chloride. You should include the half equations in your answer. Okay, so we're thinking now in this equation about reduction, okay, um, and therefore you would have oxidation as well. Okay, so remember redox is a reaction where you've got one atom that is being oxidised, and then one that is being reduced. Now in terms of uh, electrons, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain 
of electrons, okay? So what we can do is take each atom at a time and work out its charge in its different states. So magnesium here is starting as an atom, so it starts off with a zero charge. Iron is bonded to chlorine here, okay, and we can see that iron is bonded to three chlorines. Chlorine is negative one, but there are three of them, so the chlorine would have a charge of negative three. So that is therefore telling us that iron must have a charge of plus three, because if it's an ionic compound, you have the same amount of positive and negative charges, which cancel each other out. After the reaction has happened, Iron is by itself, okay, so its charge is zero. Now magnesium is now bonded to chlorine, which is Cl2, so it'll be negative two, which is chlorine now, and magnesium is plus two. Now we've worked out the charges, what we can see is iron is going from plus three to zero. So it has therefore gained negative electrons to go from a positive free charge to an overall charge of zero. So that means the iron is gaining electrons. Therefore, it is being reduced. So I would say iron is reduced. Why? Because it is gaining three electrons. And the half equation for this we were basically showing what's happening to the iron. Fe, three plus, plus three electrons makes Fe. So we're showing that the iron, in when it is a compound, is a positive free charge, it's gaining three electrons, and therefore it makes it into an iron atom, and it's no longer an ion. Okay, so that is the end of the paper. Remember, links to revision videos for each specific uh, question are on the right hand side, along with a blank copy of the paper and the mark scheme. Hope it was useful. Thank you very much.